All right, welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today is another episode of our vasopressor and inotrope series talking particularly about levosimendin. Um, and this is, we're actually getting close to the end of our vasopressor and inotrope series. So we've done a whole bunch of episodes on different vasopressors and inotropes, norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin, angiotensin 2, methylene blue, hydroxycobalamin, phenylephrine, milrinone, dobutamine, even dopamine, even mitigation. So all those episodes are on our channels, whether it's podcasting or YouTube. Check those out if you're interested. For levosimendin today, we're going to be diving into the mechanism of action, dosing and pharmacokinetics, indications both on-label and off-label, adverse effects, hemodynamic profile, some of the trials on levosimendin, clinical pearls, we'll summarize things, and then we'll actually go into some practice questions too at the end. Um, if you're interested in accessing the study guide or practice questions, check out our Patreon page. All of the study guides are on there as well as additional practice questions for our members. Um, and as always, none of this is intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Stick around to the end of the episode for the full disclaimer. No further ado, let's dive into levosimendin, starting with mechanism of action. We do have one other kind of disclaimer on this episode. So levosimendin is not approved to be used in the United States. So we practice medicine in the United States, which means that we do not use this drug. So um, everything here uh, should be accurate and good, but we just don't have the clinical exposure to this drug, um, which means that we cannot speak on some of the intricacies of the day to day. All right. Mechanism of action of levosimendin. So this drug's interesting because it's a calcium sensitizer, which makes it an inodilator. Increased contractility but causes vasodilation. So as we mentioned, this enhances myocardial contractility, but it doesn't do so by increasing intracellular calcium. So it does not increase myocardial oxygen demand. It increases the sensitivity of those myocardial muscle, heart muscle cells to the calcium already present, which is really interesting. And it does this through three key mechanisms. Mechanism one is calcium sensitization of troponin C. So troponin C is part of the myocardial contractility apparatus. And when troponin C is more sensitized to calcium, it enhances how hard that myocardial muscle cell can contract. But as um, the mechanism states it's not by increasing the amount of calcium there. It's just increasing the sensitization of troponin C to the calcium already present. And troponin C, as we said, is in those myocardial muscle cells. Second part of the mechanism is it opens ATP-sensitive potassium channels in vascular smooth muscles. This is where there's some peripheral vasodilation. So arterial and venous blood vessels um, have vascular smooth muscle kind of coating the outside. And that vascular smooth muscle helps that vein or artery contract or dilate. Um, in the vascular smooth muscle, there's these potassium channels. And olivosmendin opens more of these potassium channels. And by doing so, the smooth muscle relaxes, and it can cause arterial and venous vasodilation. Um, it does a similar thing in cardiac myocytes, right, the my muscle cells. And some folks think this might be cardioprotective to a degree, anti-stunning, anti-apoptotic, anti-inflammatory, although we don't really know that for sure. So as we mentioned, the mechanisms here, calcium sensitization of troponin C in the myocardial cells, opening of ATP-sensitive potassium channels in vascular smooth smooth muscles, and possibly opening mitochondrial ATP channels and cardiac myocytes. This will increase contractility, and it will decrease systemic vascular resistance. So those are kind of the two big things that we're going to be talking about. Um, some people kind of say it has more squeeze for less of the cost because it's not increasing myocardial oxygen demand. So it increases inotropy or contractility with lower risk of myocardial ischemia compared to catecholamine-based inotropes. So dosing and pharmacokinetics. The loading dose of levosimendin is optional, not often given, but it'd be 6 to 12 micrograms per kilogram IV over 10 minutes. But the maintenance dose, the infusion dose, which is more common, is 0.05 to 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And the onset of action is within 30 to 60 minutes, so it's not immediate. You have to be patient because it takes a little while to kick in. The half-life of the active metabolite is very long, 80 hours, this active metabolite, OR1896. So this is a super long half-life 
for an inotrope or vasopressor, and this drug then sticks around for a long time even after you stop it. Um, it's something to be aware of. So the duration of effect can last 7 to 10 days after 24 hours of infusion. 7 to 10 days this drug could be active in your body causing its effect. So you better hope you wanted it there because um, it's going to stick around for a while. This is very atypical for vasopressors and inotropes. Usually it's on the order of minutes, um, let alone hours or days. It's metabolized in the liver hepatically. So if you have severe liver dysfunction, you might actually not metabolize it as fast, and it's already metabolized really slow, um, so you could have more buildup. And then it's excreted in the urine, but its metabolites are excreted in the urine, so it's already broken down into its non-functional metabolites um, before it's excreted in the urine. Loading dose that we said is optional and not usually given can cause hypotension, which is why it's usually not given in unstable patients. Indications. In Europe, in South America, and in Asia, this is an approved medication for acute decompensated heart failure or cardiogenic shock, but it is not approved in the United States of America. Um, the reasons as to why are probably more complex, but um, a lot of the resources that we read said things like, you know, not enough evidence, possible worse long-term cardiac outcomes, uh, but again, we, we don't use it, so it's hard for us to comment on all the intricacies of that. But in Europe, South America, and Asia, it is approved for cardiogenic shock and acute decompensated heart failure um, and other low cardiac output states. It's being investigated for right ventricular failure, septic cardiomyopathy, cardiorenal syndrome, bridge to transplant. These are all similar things to above cardiogenic shock and acute decompensated heart failure. But as we mentioned, it is not FDA approved in the United States of America, although it is available in 50 other countries, more than 50 other countries. All right, adverse effects. Well, we said that it can cause vascular smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation, which can lead to hypotension. So vasodilation causing hypotension is adverse effect. It can cause headaches. The vasodilation can sometimes cause these reflexive headaches. It can cause arrhythmias, although less than dobutamine, which is another inotrope that we've talked about in this series. Uh, it can cause hypokalemia secondary to that potassium channel modulation. Remember we said it opens ATP-sensitive potassium channels, both in vascular smooth muscle as well as some mitochondria and cardiac myocytes, um, and that can lead to hypokalemia. And rarely it can cause thrombocytopenia or, or low platelets. The hemodynamic profile here um, is related to the mechanism we talked about. So for systemic vascular resistance and mean arterial pressure, remember we said it causes vasodilation, so it's going to cause a decrease in systemic vascular resistance, which will then lead to a decrease in mean arterial pressure. It does not tend to affect heart rate. It does not tend to cause the heart rate to go up. It can sometimes mildly, but not to a large degree. It does increase contractility, with little O2 cost, right? Because we said it does not increase myocardial oxygen demand that much, which is very different than a lot of our inotropes we have out there. Dobutamine, milrinone, epinephrine, all those can increase myocardial oxygen demand, but levosimendin theoretically does not. Um, so increase in cardiac uh, contractility increases cardiac output, and it can decrease pulmonary pressures too, pulmonary vascular resistance. So it could be beneficial in RV failure, pulmonary hypertension. All right, some of the trials out here, there's a lot listed here, um, and we're not going to go through too many of them, but we will just give a couple highlights. Um, again, we don't use this in the USA, so I, I'm not as plugged into all these trials, um, so take some of this with a grain of salt, but we'll give you some highlights here. There's a trial in 2022 called the LIDO trial, published in The Lancet, compared to levosimendin versus dobutamine in acute decompensated heart failure. Levosimendin improved cardiac output and had a lower 31-day mortality. Um, there's the SURVIVE trial in 2005 in JAMA. It's a large RCT, a randomized control trial of levosimendin versus dobutamine. There's no difference in all-cause mortality here, um, but possibly a benefit in patients on beta blocker use. This is not atypical, right? Dobutamine, as we've talked about in the dobutamine episode, affects beta-1 receptors. So if you're on a beta blocker and your beta-1 receptors are blocked, dobutamine won't really be able to work well. So it's not 
you know, um, it's not a surprise that levosimendin may have been better in patients on dobutamine, right? This is why patients on beta blockers instead of dobutamine in the U.S., we tend to use milrinone because milrinone works on phosphodiesterase 3 receptors. The REVIVE 1 and 2 trials published in 2006 in JAK, levosimendin versus placebo in acute heart failure. It improved symptoms, but there was more hypotension and arrhythmias in levosimendin group. The LEVO CTS trial published in 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was in cardiac surgery patients. No different in death, renal replacement therapy, mechanical circulatory support, um, but it may reduce low cardiac output syndrome post-op in selected patients. Meta-analyses through the years, it may reduce renal dysfunction, it may improve inotrope requirement, and it may um, improve weaning failure from mechanical circulatory support, but there's been no consistent mortality benefit. Um, potential signal of benefit in cardiac surgery patients and patients with right ventricular failure. So that's some of the evidence out there. If we were to summarize this into the clinical pearls, this is unique drug among inotropes. It does not increase intracellular calcium and as such does not increase your myocardial oxygen demand. It just increases your sensitivity to the calcium present. It persists for days after discontinuation due to this long acting metabolite, right? Seven to 10 days. Consider use when patients have a tachyarrhythmia or are beta blocked if you're in one of the countries that can use them. Um, it may be more useful in RV failure because it might decrease your pulmonary vascular resistance. That's what your right ventricle pumps against, the pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, may be more useful in post-cardiac surgery patients or patients with pulmonary hypertension, but who knows. Um, summary drug class, this is a calcium sensitizer and it also is a potassium ATP opener. Uh, it is not FDA approved in the US, although it is approved in more than 50 other countries. It takes about an hour for it to kick in and it can last in your system for about seven to 10 days, right? Very long half-life. Its primary effects are increasing contractility, increasing cardiac output and decreasing systemic vascular resistance and decreasing the mean arterial arterial blood pressure. Adverse effects related to this hypotension, hypokalemia, and arrhythmia are all on there. All right, should we dive into some practice questions? There's three of them, one beginner, one intermediate, and one advanced. As always, if you've seen our episodes before, we will read the question, read the multiple chase answers. We'll then give you a chance to pause the video and then dive right into the answer. So if you need more time to think, just pause the video there. All right, beginner level question. What is the primary advantage of levosimendin over traditional inotropes like dobutamine? A, it increases contractility with, without increasing oxygen demand. B, it has no vasodilatory effects. C, it is safer in severe hypotension. Or D, it has no active metabolites. All right, pause here if you need more time. The answer is A, it increases contractility without increasing oxygen demand. As we mentioned, levosimendin sensitizes troponin C in the myocardial cells to calcium without increasing intracellular calcium amounts. Thus, it increases inotropy without increasing myocardial oxygen demand. Other options in this question. B, it has no vasodilatory effects. We know that it actually does cause vasodilation, so that is not true. It is safe in severe hypotension. Again, causes vasodilation, so that is not true. And it has no active metabolites. We said the active metabolite actually lasts in the system for seven to 10 days. So you know that is not true as well. All right, intermediate level question. Which of the following mechanisms explains levosimendin's ability to reduce pulmonary artery pressures? A, beta-2 stimulation. B, phosphodiesterase 3 inhibition. C, opening mitochondrial potassium ATP channels. Or D, smooth muscle vasodilation via potassium ATP channels. Pause here if you need more time. The answer is D, smooth muscle vasodilation via potassium ATP channels. So levosimendin, as we talked about, causes vasodilation of the blood vessels by activating this ATP potassium sensitive channel in vascular smooth muscle. This reduces both systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance and explains why it could reduce pulmonary artery pressures. What are the other options here? A was beta-2 stimulation. Levosmenin does not have beta-2 effects. Some of our adrenergic vasopressors have some beta-2 effects. Dobutamine is the inotrope that uh, does have beta-2 effects, leading to some vasodilation. Option B was PDE3, phosphodiesterase 3 inhibition. This is the mechanism of milrinone. 
And then option C was opening mitochondrial potassium ATP channels. Leosmenin does do this, but it just doesn't answer the question. All right, last but not least, advanced level. A 67-year-old patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy, an ejection fraction of 20% is on metoprolol and develops acute decompensated heart failure in one of the countries in which levosimendin can be used. Which inotrope is most favorable and why? A, dobutamine due to quick titration and short half-life. B, dopamine due to beta-1 effect and MAP support. C, levosimendin as its effects are independent of beta receptor stimulation. D, milrinone due to its PDE3 inhibition and rapid onset. Pause here if you need more time. The correct answer is C, as one could imagine. Levosimendin as its effects are independent of beta receptor stimulation. Remember, there's a calcium sensitizer. It does not work through uh, sensitizer. We couldn't spell for a sec. It does not work through um, the catecholaminergic or adrenergic receptors like beta receptors. So in patients on chronic beta blocker therapy, catecholamine-based inotropes like dobutamine and dopamine are less effective. Levosimendin enhances contractility through calcium sensitization and is unaffected by beta receptor blockade. Milrinone actually would be a reasonable choice as well, um, which we put it in there just so you'd think more about it. But this explains the other options, dobutamine. Uh, dobutamine uh, uses beta receptors, so it would not be a good choice in patients on beta blocker therapy. Dopamine does the same thing, and we don't really use dopamine anyways. And then milrinone is actually a reasonable choice in the US. This is the choice we use in patients on chronic beta blockers because we don't have access to levosimendin. All right, that's all we have for you today. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have. If you want to access this study guide or additional practice questions, check out our Patreon members page. Uh, if you have any more uh, vasopressor and inotrope curiosities, check out the playlist uh, linked in the episode description. Um, anyone who uses Leave Us a Minute, we'd love to hear about it. Um, it seems really interesting. It seems like it could be a useful drug. Uh, but again, we have not been able to use it. So let us know your experience with it. We'd love to hear. Either way, stay well, keep learning. We'll certainly see you next time. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on.